<laughs> okay. Ross, <laughs> how are you? How are you? I'm good. I'm fine, thank you very much. It's been a pretty chilled out day, which has been nice. Finally saw one of my friends for the first time since the lockdown happened, which is nice because he's um, no more than about two or three miles as the crow flies, but it's across a border, so uh, I haven't seen him for about a month. <laughs> so it was nice he managed to get him sick one today, so that was cool. Awesome, awesome. And uh, overall, how has uh, life in uh, quarantine uh, been for uh, you, your family, and everyone in uh, Switzerland. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's been fine, to be absolutely honest. It's uh, um, as, as much as I, as you can expect, I suppose. It's, uh, it gets boring from time to time, but it's still um, it's still fine. I've got my dog. I've got my uh, fiancé here as well, which helps. Uh, oh, so awesome. I'm bored. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And uh, through the quarantine, how are you uh, keeping in uh, playing shape when you have... Uh, well, when many of us have nothing to uh, prepare for at the moment. Sure. Well, um, the good thing about right just now is that um, I can pick and choose as I want to. So if I really need to be in shape for something, I can uh, get in shape for it. For example, uh, I've just been starting to work on some videos and stuff like that to put online at some point. Uh, hopefully soon. I'm just really bad at the whole... Uh, I'm good at the audio editing, but the um, video editing part, I'm not very good at yet. So <laughs> got to work that bit out and try and put it all together and uh, not make it look like a lot of rubbish. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's um, it's nice to do little things like that just now. And at the end of the year, I'm supposed to be playing the Gregson Concerto. So oh, I need awesome. to be work. Yeah, playing that. So I want, I'd love to play it by memory. So I need to start learning it and I've only ever really played it on E flat before so I've got, to, I've got to give myself a challenge and do it on F so it's gonna be good fun doing that as well so it's I've got I've got some goals to work towards which is good so okay. um awesome. the general kind of I suppose the general kind of um staying in shape part isn't so important until I have to work again but I'm just doing bits and bobs just to keep myself on my toes so that if someone does call and say okay let's go and play then I can which is great so Right. We just uh, we don't know when we're going to be back to work again yet, so it's right. kind of yeah. Hopefully, hopefully at the end of this month we'll have some small projects, but yeah, you never know. That's the thing. So <laughs> absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, awesome. So in at least uh, to an extent, and in, in my opinion, uh, I, I feel like we all have the uh, same routine somewhat since we're all locked inside of our homes. Uh, right now, anyway. So uh, instead, I'll ask this: uh, on a pre-pandemic day, uh, what, what is a normal day for you like? From start to finish, you mean? Know. <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. If you'd like. <laughs> In the word of the proclaimers, when I wake up, I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I mean, it's. Um, I suppose pretty pretty normal to most people's every every day um get up like i say i've got my dog taken for a walk um i suppose it's best if i can just talk about the orchestral schedule i suppose so here in the orchestra of swiss Ramond, we have a monday monday and tuesday are main rehearsal days basically so you'd see us go in from 10 to 12 13 and then 2 30 to 5 on a monday and tuesday or other rehearsals um so i mean i obviously get try and get in as early as i can to get warmed up but i've moved out to the countryside now which is great uh a lot more uh, space etc but uh, it means that i've got a 20 to 30 minute cycle in the morning depending on which way the wind's blowing so uh, <laughs> get into the, so that also can determine my warm-up in the morning as well depending on the weather so it's uh yeah so i suppose it starts off with that um, then I just like to chill out as much as I can at the, on the top of that. Wednesdays, we always have a general rehearsal in the morning and the concert in the evening, which is nice. And uh, the beautiful Victoria Hall, if you haven't seen the Victoria Hall in Geneva, uh, check it out online. Um, you can find it on Google, whatever. It's um, really a stunning, stunning building. And interesting fact, it was actually a Scottish architect who uh, designed oh, it. Awesome. So, um, it's a lovely place. It's a really, it's a quite small hall. So um, we've got a very powerful brass section actually. So it's uh, we have to be careful sometimes when we're playing in there. But uh, it's uh, it's good fun. 
Um, then sometimes we have a concert in Geneva on a Thursday um, and also maybe once a month we play in Lausanne, which is just an hour away from here on a Thursday mm-hmm. night. And sometimes we play on a Friday. Uh, so it's pretty chill, actually. I've got a lot of spare time to do what I want, exercise, etc. Um, I suppose on the social side as well, we have we have a very nice orchestra here, actually, where everybody's like good friends and get on well. There's not really any kind of... Um, uh, I don't know what the word would be, but um, there's no kind of tension between people and stuff like that, which is very unusual for uh, a symphony orchestra of high, high caliber because uh, <laughs> there's always problems with people. And stuff. I mean, of course, there are from um, time to time, but actually we're um, a very happy orchestra here. I think it's probably the swift there, you know, but uh, <laughs> yeah. It, uh, yeah, it's good. So uh, I've got my football team as well. So which is the Geneva Scottish Football Club. I try and keep as much of my stuff as I can. Really, I, I love it, but that's, um, that's my kind of main friend base here, which is great. So that's my thing to do on the side. So we go... Geneva's my, my, my very first flatmate here. Um, she said... I went to the supermarket and came back and I spent about 50 francs, which is around $50, something like that, yeah. on one small bag of groceries. And I came back and I said to her, oh my goodness, this is the most expensive I've ever seen. And she said, yes, Geneva is either expensive or very expensive. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so that was, um, yeah. And so Geneva's social life can be a little bit, uh, yeah. There's only so far you can go with it. But uh, right. yeah, we, 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 being British, we like to stick to the, the pub scene if we can a little bit. But so one one night a week I'd probably end up in the pub with my mates and stuff like that, which is nice. So I hope that answers the question. Sorry. Yeah, I was yeah, a bit yeah. No, no, not at all. That's great. <laughs> That's great. But yeah, it's, it's a kind of a just it's the same as I suppose every most people's life. We almost work nine to five, uh, right. two days in the week and another week's are pretty more the other days are just the evening concerts, which is nice because it gives us plenty of time. And when we we play opera here as well. So um Maybe every few months we do a full opera, which takes about a month. The symphony orchestra runs at the same time as it, so we've got basically we have with the full orchestra we would have 112 players in total. Not all the positions are filled all the time, but if we had it, that would be the number. So we always have almost always have an opera and the symphony orchestra going at the same time. To be honest, so which is pretty exciting. So when the opera's on, we're working a lot more. Like it's. Um, the rehearsal periods are two weeks long, almost every single day. Um, and then, but then the concerts, when they come, it's just one day on, one day off, one day on in the evening. So it's not even crazy when it gets to the concerts. But yeah, so I mean, it's, it's actually really, really relaxed. And it's a, we have a lot of free time to spend with ourselves, families, whatever, which is really, I think it's quite special. It's good. It's a, it's a good, awesome. good conditions for the orchestra here. So Awesome, awesome. That's great. So uh, talk a bit about your uh, routine. You showed me a bit of the exercises, but uh, is there like a certain theme to your uh, routine, certain aspects of your uh, playing you address, or is it more uh, open-ended, so to speak? Sure. Well, I mean, my routine uh, mostly depends on how I'm feeling in the day. So some days I walk into the room and I feel like I can take on the world. I, I feel like I can just go and play immediately. I don't. Uh, I know not a lot of people might be annoyed at hearing that, but <laughs> it's uh, it's one of those things where I can walk in to smash out a top F and like, okay, let's go, <laughs> we're, we're good to go today. And then some days I walk in and I split everything in the room, but it's um, so that d- determines how I begin and end and my my warm up with whatever. But almost everything I do is scalic, so based on scales, arpeggios, etc. And I find it incredibly important. My teacher, I was taught by Patrick Harold at the Royal Academy of Music. Uh, he was the tuba player in the London Symphony Orchestra for a very long time. Before that, in the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, and um, he has a really perfect analogy for this, which is that scales are the alphabet of the language in which we have chosen to speak. I think we spoke about this last week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I love it. I think it's such a fantastic. I'll say it again because I really love it. Scales are the alphabet of the language in which we have chosen to speak, the language being music. Right. And I think it's, I think it's perfect. It's um, such a good analogy because it really is, everything that we play is based on scales. So I think, why, why not 
my daily routine, um, warming up, etc. I base it on that as well. Starting off with long tones, uh, usually chromatic, going back to starting in the middle, go always going back to the same note, but going down chromatically. <clears throat> Moving on to flexibilities afterwards. Um, flexibilities and pyrotechnics, you might call it, but uh, it's blind running instrument and uh, all these kind of arpeggio scales and stuff like that. And um, I always try and keep it, I always try and mix it up a little bit. So I won't just go da 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 You know, I'll do it in thirds, I'll do it in, uh, what do you call it? So in thir- thirds, um, ba da da if I do scales, I go da 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 and in threes as well. So da 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 all that kind of stuff as well. So um, the same with my arpeggio, arpeggios go da 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 and it makes it more fun because scales can be boring, obviously. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think right. Better than that. <laughs> so trying to find, because they're so important. So I just try and have a bit of fun with it. I've got some games I put in at the end as well, which I play, I do it with my colleagues, which uh, I think we did some of them as well last week as well, you and I, Brandon. So uh, um, these were ones that were taught by uh, Peter Gain when I was in the European Youth Orchestra. And they're great. I think he's even written books with these in them as well, so you can always oh, find things. So I'll have to check those out. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, how long does it normally take when you go through everything? Um, anything from fifteen minutes to an uh, an hour, usually. Like I say, it depends. It depends on how much time I have as well. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I get up late and I get there five minutes before, and I've got five minutes to warm up and get up on stage for two tubas, three tubas. Sometimes, depending on what the program right. is, but. Um, if I get there an hour before, to take it easy, have a coffee, slowly go through it, speak to people at the same time. It's like it's just the the earlier I, I always find the earlier you get there, the more relaxed you're going to be in a rehearsal. Oh, okay, awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. obvious, it's obvious, but it's um, it's how it is. I mean, you just have to be. If you can get there early, do it. I mean, some I was going to say, but some of my colleagues get there like two hours early to warm up in the morning, and that's their way of doing it. Like I say, I personally can turn up and like don't. Don't even need to warm up; just go and play. But a lot of some of my colleagues really have these really long um, routines that they do almost every single morning before they play. And it's always I always love hearing it because everybody it's like their signature when you hear someone's warm up. It's like this is you know who it is when you hear it, when you hear it before you even see them, which is great because of what they're doing, what they're playing, the sound they're making, etc. It's really it's interesting to hear it. So, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's really cool. Awesome. So uh, talk about some of your uh, early influences, people who uh, influenced you to uh, pursue music, pick up the tuba, uh, influence you to uh, continue picking up the tuba, uh, things of that nature. Yeah, well, uh, from the very start, so I, I grew up brass banding, basically, which in Britain is obviously such a huge thing. I suppose out in the States and stuff like that, it's not really as big a thing. Um, you've got like Fountain City Band and stuff like that, which is, um, I think they're in Florida. I think so. And it doesn't matter, but I mean, that's how I grew up doing it. So I had so many brass band influences and stuff like that while I was growing up. And especially like, growing up in Scotland, there's a good band scene there. Um, unfortunately, like the band that I was in was, was fairly decent for the area. And we had a, an amazing youth band um, where we were British champions for years and years and years, basically. Um, and we grew from nothing to that as well. So within about two years, we'd gone from just coming on the scene to be the British champions. And it was really exciting. So my teacher, who was the conductor as well, was a huge influence on me then. He started me straight onto tuba when I was nine years old. So I didn't start on trumpet, didn't start on your phone or anything. just went straight onto it on a baby bass, the E flat bass that was there. Three valves beaten out of case and basically falling apart, but it was uh, I fell in love with it the minute that I started. By ten, I knew that I wanted to study music thanks to him and his support and stuff like that. Awesome. And then obviously all through this time and still now, my parents were obviously huge influences as well. They weren't; they're not necessarily musicians. They they love they're both singing in the choir. My dad was a pipe band drummer. My mum played 
piano, clarinet, etc. When she was younger, but she's not. But they're not musicians as their profession, is what I mean. Um, but they supported me, took me everywhere. Me and my brother and sister as well. Everywhere we needed to go for music, we were there, and they took us and supported us. Made sure that we had what we needed. And the, I was my rest of my family as well. My grandparents bought my first tuba, for example, and my auntie bought my most recent tuba so um i'm very lucky that way as well that i've got the support from my family around me and it's um yeah it, without it I, I wouldn't be here today basically and obviously getting on later and um still my young career like my, my early career but my my teacher patrick harold was just like an idol all the way through my um my studies before it as well, when you hear this tuba player of the London Symphony Orchestra, when you hear that he's played on Star Wars, everything, it's like, it's just, oh, it's, it's amazing. You know, when you watch these films that you absolutely love, and it's like, oh, I'm going to go and study with this guy. He's played on this and that, and amazing. And, now, and then when you get to that stage of going back, and then I've, I've done, I did a film session, not a film session, um, a session that for Eurosport a few years ago with London Symphony Orchestra while on trial, and it was just, I was in awe sitting there in the uh, air studios in London, like recording this music for the U uh, Eurosport Winter Olympics. And I was like, oh, it's so cool. And I was sitting in the seat that he'd sat in, you know, for all these years with the London Symphony Orchestra. I was like, this is just, this is magic, you know? Yeah. So, and then all the way through, I mean, Alexander von Puttkammer, who is my um, mentor and teacher in the Karyan Academy. It's obviously another big influence on me. As is Jens Bjorn Larsson, who's my other teacher in Hanover. Um, when I did my master's there. And yeah, I mean, there are so many different people. And these are just the tuba players I'm talking about and the brass teachers. I mean, you can, you can speak all day about people who have influenced me. Um, conductors, there was the, I did a podcast uh, earlier with um, the British bandsmen in Britain and we were speaking about the conductor of the National Youth Brass Band of Scotland, who's a guy called Richard Evans. Now, Richard's, I think, well into his 80s now, but he's still exactly the same as when I first met him when I was 12 years old. He's like, so full of energy and exciting and such a cool guy. And then you got someone like that standing up in front of a band. And he's English, but he always wore a kilt, and his kilt always swayed from side to side when he was conducting. And, ah, oh, just the, the fun that he put into learning uh, it was such an influence and it made it really stuck with me working with people like him as well and i say there were so many people like so far in my career that i've managed to meet who were really exciting and cool people and i hope that everybody who plays music now gets to meet people like this in their life because it's so important because really you need these people to push you on and to give you some kind of influence to keep going and because I mean there are tough times when you go along as well so you need these people to push you through and encourage you and give you something to work for basically so it is it's exciting when you've got that in your life Absolutely. it's really cool yeah awesome so uh by the looks of it you've been able to uh experience a uh, lot of uh ensemble playing in Europe you grew up in uh, Scotland uh you did your undergrad in uh in uh, London uh later played professionally in London uh, went to Germany, later played professionally in Germany, and uh, now you're in Switzerland. Uh, I'm just wondering how you've benefited from all of these experiences. Um, I mean, every single experience um, has been, it's like a stepping stone, if you like, all the time. And I suppose it never stopped, which is really exciting. The most exciting bit is that, I mean, there's always something else new around the corner, whether it's going back to the same orchestra you've played in before and play something new. But, um, I mean, when I was at college, I never had the experience to play professionally um, in London because there are far too many tuba players there already. They're all freelancers and they need the work more than I do at the time. And it's, that's how it was. So when I got to the end of my time uh, at the Royal Academy, which was, yeah, 2004, 15, I think it was. So I fin just finished my uh, diploma. And I still had never worked, I'd worked professionally as a soloist, but never worked professionally in an orchestra. So that was when my teacher gave me my first gig, which he, he does that for his, his students that he thinks are going to go on to, um, to do something good afterwards, basically. And he can trust them to come in and play. So I went and played Symphony Fantastique beside Patrick Harold in the LSO. 
and that was kind of where it started. Then I went and played the Royal Opera House as, as just stage bands playing uh, Romeo and Juliet stage band, which was really interesting as well, and getting to meet people that uh, had been in the business forever. You know, it was yeah. dead exciting. And then suddenly I was out in Germany, and it was like, wow, okay, this is different in such a great way. The first day that I got out to Germany, I was in Leipzig because the Gewandhaus Orchestra had an audition and I went there and and I'd never, I'd done one audition before that or something like, no, I'd done, I'd done a few, but like one where I'd been like vaguely successful that wasn't a youth orchestra. And I got through the second round of Danish radio at that time. But this one, the Gewandhaus, I got there and it's like my first time in Germany. I really hope, and I'd had some lessons with people in Germany. I really hope this is going to go well. And I turned up I didn't even get to the first round. And I was like, oh. okay, what a great start in Germany. <laughs> so, I mean, there's many stepping stones that are forward. There are these ones that come that obviously, it's like, ah, oh. oh, well. And then, so I, I stayed with a friend there and we hung out and everything. And then I went and I started in Hanover just after this and started to study with Jens and Bjorn Larsen. And yeah, it was like, my world, my, my eyes were opened up to a whole new perspective of playing and a new way of learning as well in this class of like 15 tuba players, which is the biggest class I'd ever seen. It was insane. And sitting there every day and learning. And then I got into the Carrion Academy. So that was another, the next stepping stone forward. Getting to play with Berlin Phil during that time, sitting, listening to Alexander playing. Because we, we had access to every single rehearsal, every single concert. Um, we had our own individual concerts, solo concerts for us as well that we put on. Um, and then you get the chance to play as well. And I was lucky enough to, in my second week, I played as principal tuba with the orchestra, as a PLS and music and uh, opera, which was because there's not a lot to do in the tuba part, so you could trust me to leave alone already. So it was uh, a, 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 the scariest, most exciting moment in my life was sitting on stage in the Philharmonie in the first rehearsal. And I was like, oh my God, I'm playing with the Berlin Phil right now. <laughs> it was crazy. But it was, uh, yeah, I mean, that was like a wild moment in my, my life. Um, and obviously, I, I just locked myself in a room for six months in the Philharmonie, uh, going back and forth to Hanover, having my lessons there um, with Jens, learning with Alexander. And then six months later, just sitting playing excerpts out of the gold book. Uh, I'm playing the Vaughan Williams first movement and second movement so I could do an audition yeah I won a job and I mean I had I had a few I had a go at Weimar as well my friend Max Wagner Shibata won the job there and Max and I went down to Swiss Ramond the week later and I won there so it was uh, exciting you know it was, it was great and actually I'd gone for the Gavant House just before that again the second time around because no one got it the first time and I came second that time Oh, so that's awesome. my, my progression over six months from not getting through the first round of the pre-audition to getting through to the final of the main audition. And that was like seeing the progress, like where I'd come from and going and I knew where I was going, my goals. And then a few, like a month later, I won the job in Switzerland. And it was like, ah, oh, yeah. So I knew everything was starting to snowball and going well. And then I got the job here and it was like, okay. And now it's like, it's great because I get, the chance now I have a fixed position to go and do what I want, which right. is that's the, that's the nice thing now. So I can find other things to do, which is whether it's going playing somewhere else or trying to teach people or whatever. Which is I I love it. It's just it's such a great career, and it's uh I've worked really hard to get there. So right, yeah, 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 yeah I bet. Awesome. So uh, speaking of orchestra playing in uh, Europe, uh, there's a famed. Uh, I guess, famed, quote-unquote, uh, debate or discussion, if you will, uh, between my colleagues, my uh, friends, my classmates, of the uh, difference between uh, Northern American orchestras and uh, European orchestras and set in terms of uh, identity and uh, stylistic approaches. Uh, I, I just thought I'd, I'd get your uh, opinion on that or see if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, this is, uh, this is always a... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> this eight-old question because the, the amazing thing about mo moving to Switzerland to Swiss Ramond, the Swiss Ramond is, um, I think that I think our orchestra sees ourselves as a French-style orchestra, and it's not. It's because it's amazing because this American style obviously ended up in France when, especially in the brass band. I'm not really sure how exactly, but Mel Culbertson came across to France and started teaching there, and he became a legend in France, obviously, and. The style of tuba playing changed there 
it's fine. funnily enough, it's starting to change again. People are starting to play B flat tubas now in France instead of C tuba. Oh, yeah. um, looking more at German instruments as well instead of the kind of more um, piston valve. So they're kind of going away from this uh, American style again. But um, I mean, if, I, if I'm being blunt and honest, I do prefer the European style to the American <laughs> style from here. But the thing is, like, when you listen to something like so the Salty Salt recordings with Chicago are outstanding. Sometimes it's just too much for me, but that's just my opinion. I mean, I, but when, I mean you, you know me now. I, I play a big B in the SF tuba. I play E flat, which is like a small contrabass tuba, and I play a bit of Melton 197 B flat. Yeah. So it's, I mean, I play on big machinery. You know, it's, I, it's all about this deep, dark sound, basically. And I don't, I mean, maybe I wouldn't fit into an American orchestra at all because of it. I don't know. Maybe I could change my sound. I, I, I really don't know. I actually don't have experience of playing with a North American orchestra, so I'd be really interested to find out what it would be like. So it's a hard question for me to answer this because oh, no of that. No worries. No worries at all. But no worries at all. The one thing, and I, I have this question for you, actually, is do you think that there's a style throughout the whole of North America then? Or, is it, or does each side of the country have its own style? Because I, I, I don't even know this. This is uh, something oh, that interests man. me not to know. <laughs> uh, in my personal opinion, ho- hopefully I don't get, I don't get, uh, what's the for this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, bashed or, or uh, put at the stake for this, so to speak. Uh, but in, in, in my personal opinion, at least, uh, yeah, there's a difference from uh, East Coast to uh, West Coast orchestras. Uh, sure. In in the uh, states, yeah, that's yeah yeah. I'd I'd have to go with that. Uh, right. But they're they're all great, of course. Uh, of course. But I yeah I don't know. Listening maybe to a recording from uh, the Philharmonic, uh, New York Philharmonic, uh, yeah. versus the same recording with I don't know San Francisco. Uh, I'll I'll mm-hmm. say as an example. They're both wonderful, of course. Uh, but yeah, I, I would say there there are different stylistic approaches, uh, right? Like subtle differences between each orchestra. Sure. Yeah. Because I mean, um, like I said, I don't know enough about this because I've never been there to never even been there to play. Actually, to be I've only been there because my brother lives in the states. That's why I, <laughs> I've been to the states before. But um, yeah, I mean, for for I mean, you've got states there that are bigger than the countries in Europe, but the styles in Europe change much more drastically, much more quickly as you go from different countries because there's so many different culture changes from country to country as well. And I'm sure there's culture changes from state to state as well in the States, but I don't think it's really quite as much as when you're speaking an entirely different language in every single country that you go to, <laughs> to be honest. So, I mean, when, you, when you're in Britain, Britain is this, um, I, I love the British style. I really do brass playing. It's uh, very, very powerful in such a good way. It's, it's always got a, a very clean, and we always like say with good front and good length, basically. So like, there's always a good attack with plenty of length in the sound. So you never play stuff short, like really short and stabby and stuff. And um, it's never too bright. It's always a bit, it's not, it's not dark. It's, it's, all, it's a brilliant sound that the brass always has, I find. Especially the LS always has a kind of unique sound um, to the rest of them, but uh, the film, the Philharmonia Orchestra, for example, they have the most, the biggest brass sound I think I've ever heard in my life. I, I love it. It's so much fun playing there because you can give everything, and the strings will match it, which is incredible. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, it's the most amazing experience to play with that orchestra. Um, but then you go across to France, and then everything kind of changes again. It's. Uh, like I say, maybe it's a bit more towards the, the American style. It's it's a bit, but not not nearly, not nearly as powerful. I'd say it's more direct. Um, the sound uh, with a this is a funny articulation. I shouldn't say this, but right, now, but I, I don't like the articulation of French players a lot of the time. It's changing now, but it's like a kind of old style French um, articulation, which uh, which gets in my nerves sometimes because it kind of goes foie foie a little bit. I, I may, that's not everybody. There's a few people who I've come across very occasionally. And it's, but I mean, like I say, times have changed again as well. And it's, this stuff's all going away and everything's kind of, it's again a little bit more universal. Then you go to Germany and you've got 
this huge dark sound of big German trumpets, big German trombones, and like I say, these big melting tubas and stuff like that. And it's yeah, and then Austria is a different style again, but in a German style. And the one that I find the most amazing is obviously in Switzerland. You have the Tonhalle Orchestra. It's like we bookend, so the OSR on the on the west, which I don't know if my hands are on the right side to do this, but it's good. but say this is the west. This is the west with the, with the OSR, which is on the French side. You've got the Tonhalle in Zurich, which is on the east side, basically. And if you imagine them as the bookmarks of Switzerland. You've got the Tonhalle, which is German style, and the Swiss German, which is French style. I, I don't agree with it being French. I think we've got so many different influences that it's almost not possible to be French anymore. Um, but that you get my point anyway. Yeah. But it's really cool that in the same country you can have, it's just, there's not a style. It's like each orchestra is different here in one country. So it's really, that's exciting as well. And it keeps you on your toes again. So I mean, when I play in the Tonhalle from time to time, I play completely differently from how I play in the OSR, right. which is really cool. Yeah. Same machine, way, different way of playing entirely. So it's really cool. And when I go back to Germany, it's the same thing. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, keeps you on your toes. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So uh, day to day in the uh, OSR, uh, how has the experience been like? Uh, what was the selection process like? Uh, how did you prepare? And uh, was there any moment through the uh, preparation or even uh, during the audition? Uh, where you kind of said to yourself, like, this is mine, I feel it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the, 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 this was the, the craziest audition that was probably the one that I've been to because of the amount of people that were there. Um, they really invited everybody. And I was in the pre-audition uh, and the main audition because I obviously got through the pre-audition first. Um, so I was invited right to start where there was, when I walked in and there were something like 55 tuba players there on the first day. I think eight of us got through the fir- the pre-audition, the pre-selection, and then there were, uh, 50, I don't know, I, th- I think it totaled 89 over the two days, 89 players. And stuff. There's like 55, 56 tuba players, all with two tubas in the same room. And when you think of it that way, there were over a hundred tubas in one room, and this room was not big. <laughs> the noise walking into that room was just—it was like—it gives you a headache just thinking about it. But imagine, like, so I had to walk into this room and warm up and try and concentrate, and I was like, "Oh my goodness, how am I going to do this?" And then I played—I thought I thought I played like rubbish in the first in the first round of the pre-selection. And so I went and put my tubas back in the flax. I knew, I was like, I'm not getting through this. I'm not getting through this first round. And then I came back for the results. And I was one of the eight that got through. I was like, oh, crap, right. I better go get my tubas and do some practice. <laughs> Make sure I don't do this tomorrow. Um, so, yeah. So I just kind of, I, because I knew that I'd, got, I'd gotten by a, a bit of luck in the first, that first round, I, I thought, okay, that's my kick up the butt. I know what I need to do tomorrow. And... From then, I kind of got into the zone and everything went right. And I think in each round, I had one tiny little mistake after that. And everything else went exactly as I wanted to do it. And I mean, there wasn't really a point when I thought this is mine, but there was also like, I I got through the final, there were three of us left. And there was one Swiss guy, one French guy, and me, this British guy, this Scottish guy, just sitting there like, ah. Am I, uh, how am I going to win against a Swiss guy and a French guy in an orchestra that's primarily French and is based in Switzerland? <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> so I went, I, and so I phoned my, my girlfriend, my now fiance, who's next door, and I said, what am I going to do? And she went, go for it. And that was it. <laughs> awesome. I, uh, it was enough to, to spur me on. And I just went in and I played, played my heart out in the final. And it was the, the great part about that audition was is that the final was with the section. So I got to show what I can do with the brass section. Okay. So, our trombone section. So we did, uh, it's like Mahler 2, uh, chorales. Um, uh, I'm trying to think what else there was. There was the opening of Alpine Symphony. Uh, oh, and wow. Bruckner 8 was the last one as well that I had to do. And that was like, it was perfect. I'd just done Mahler 2 and Bruckner 8 that year in the Gustav Mahler Youth Orchestra. Right. So I knew the pieces inside out, back to front. I knew exactly what I had to play, when I had to play it. And it was great just having that knowledge of the music. So and the preparation for it because of that, I, 
I knew that my final ride was kind of going to be, I suppose, okay. So the rest of the stuff, because I mean, some of the reptiles play it hard, like the uh, Rheingold Worm Solo, Siegfried. Uh, that's the first round of the main audition was basically a Siegfried Dragon Solo from start to finish. And, oh, okay. and then Fountains of Rome. So and that was all you had to get through to the next round. There was no concerto. It's like, you have to be able to play the contrabass super really well to get to the first round. And I was like, oh my goodness. And so, I mean, I've worked and worked and worked. Um, like I said, I spent about six months just sitting in the basement of the film on just practicing excerpts. And that was how I just got good at them because I listened to a million different recordings of each piece, found the one which I loved the most. Like that one which I loved, not just that I liked, one which I was like, this is how I want to play it. This is exactly how it has to be for me. And because, I mean, there's, there's only so far how you can push yourself to be in the style of an orchestra that you're going to audition for. You have to take that into into consideration obviously because you can't go into a german style orchestra and play like a frenchman for example you have to be able to adapt to the certain style which they're expecting and the same way like that but turns out that the osr was looking for the sound which a german instrument b flat would make for the tuba and that was it was worked in my favor that day i mean there were five people in the second round playing b flats and three playing c in the final round two playing b flat one play c so that's just the sign they were obviously looking for. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just, I, I was taking all this stuff into consideration, finding recordings which I really wanted to make the sound like that. And, yeah, so I just, I, I suppose that was kind of my, and I was preparing three auditions at the same time, one for Weimar, one for OSR, and one for Munich Philharmonic. So it was like, I was really, really ready for doing auditions because I was yeah. doing so much every single repertoire every bit of repertoire you could think of for doing an audition I had to prepare and it was like it was crazy it was brilliant but crazy so it was exciting um, so I really had to be prepared and I, I kind of I set up my, a practice log I had um, timings all set out for everything and then I'd go through so I'd play the first round straight through go and take a break come back maybe do it again or fix the stuff which had gone wrong. And I'd always record myself and find out what I'd done right and wrong and mark it in the part where I had to play longer, where I had to play shorter, where I had to breathe, everything, making sure that my, my parts were flawless, basically. Like, I couldn't mess up for that reason. So, um, and yeah, so then I go to the second round and go to the final round, et cetera, of each thing and making sure that my vom lines have been rehearsed with piano before, which is important too, because I mean, if you've, I think almost everybody's played the volumes with the piano when they get to the stage of doing an audition. But if you haven't, it's so important to get the chance to because when you walk in and they go, "Bing!" Right there's your A. Okay, bum 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 bum, and then suddenly it's like doo, 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 your heart stumping, everything's going crazy. You're like, they, luckily at that stage that there was still a screen, so we I couldn't see them. But then when the screen's away. Because sometimes it happens like that. They don't do it with a screen and you've got like 20 people sitting there like this. And it's like, what, what do you do then? It's like, am I, are they enjoying this? Are they liking my playing? And you start doubting yourself, but then you just have to realize, okay, put the blinkers on, just like blind is like, okay, I'm just going to play and enjoy myself, put on a performance for them. And you also have to, I always find that you have to put a performance on even when you've got the screen there. You have to imagine that you've got an audience in front of you, even though they're not there. Right. And it's uh, so all these things I had going around in my head, and I was trying to mentally prepare myself and stuff. And I do that every time I do an audition now because it's so important. Yeah, I hope uh, that answers. That. No, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, are there any uh, uh, techniques, if you will, that you use in order to, uh, I guess, bring the heart rate down when you are in the uh, middle of everything, so to speak? Yeah, well, I mean, breathing. Breathing is such an important thing. Making sure you're taking good deep breaths before you start. <laughs> Relaxing, taking your time thinking right before you start an excerpt. They, 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 behind the screen, they might think, they might think, well, why are they taking so long to do it? But it doesn't matter. You take your time. Every time you're going to play something, it's like you look at it, you go, okay, yeah, I'm doing this here, that there, that there. Taking some deep breaths, just sitting there relaxing. Let your body be as relaxed as you can. And hopefully your heart rate will come down. Obviously, there's always a little bit of anxiety or nervousness or something like that, or a load of adrenaline. I'm lucky I get adrenaline rather than shaky nerves, basically. So that's um, a lucky thing for me. Um, but some people have to find ways to deal with this. And 
people read like that. Um, the book, the inner game of tennis and stuff like that to help with these things. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I also find like, I, I try and exercise a lot. I eat healthily before, uh, even before I did the Stats Capella Berlin audition last year. I think it was last year or the year before. And I didn't drink a drop of alcohol for a few weeks before as well. So just trying to stay as healthy as I possibly could and stuff like that to try and be in the right mindset and everything. And because I mean, you have to be, it's just trying to be the best on the day and that's it. So, I mean, if you put, if you put things in the, in your way, it's uh, it's so difficult. And also it's like, it's, it's, it's all a mental game at the end of the day as well. I, I find that I can talk myself in and out of playing the right notes sometimes. It's amazing. Like if I've got coming up to something, it's like, I'm going to mess this up and I mess it up. It's obvious yeah. it's going to happen. Then if I go, no, I'm going to nail this. I'll nail it. It's like, it's, and then if I don't nail it, I've just gotten unlucky. At least I know that I've gone in with the right attitude. So yeah, yeah. that's it. I mean, these kind of techniques hopefully help and trying to stay, you've got to stay as healthy as possible as well in your mind and your body, every, everything about it. It's all physical. That's the thing. So it's, and the mind, everything's connected. So if you go with the right mindset, you can calm yourself down. Awesome. And yeah. yeah, so it's good. And taking everything that's going on around you, I mean, you meet some fantastic people at these auditions as well. Just speaking to people. And not everybody does that. I, I do. I speak to whoever if they want to. And I see all my friends there and I hang out with them. And that's how I stay relaxed. A lot of people don't want to speak to anybody while they're at an audition as well. Right. And that's fine. You leave those people alone. You let them do what they want to. But you find what works for you. Go there and enjoy it. That's the thing. So, awesome. Yeah, that's all great. Awesome. Uh, so we discussed your uh, routine a bit uh, a bit earlier. Uh, but after that's done, after you've gotten through everything, how do you go about uh, scheduling your uh, practice sessions throughout the uh, day? Um, it depends. Sometimes I don't have time, um, or sometimes I just don't want to. If I've if I've had a heavy rehearsal. Or a conductor's annoyed me. It's like I, my mind's not there. I won't practice. Um, we're, we're lucky that in, near Victoria Hall we have our practice studios um, as well, just five minutes walk away, so I, I can go there and practice. It's open all, all the time. Um, so yeah, I mean it's it, it's very much day to day for me. What I need to do, what I want, is really what I need to do is when I practice and what I practice. So if I've had a long day but I know that I have to get ready. So say we're doing, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. Right, say, say we haven't done it here, but say I'm doing Britain 8, so everything's low, everything's loud. But then the next week I've got to do pictures of an exhibition, I've got to play bead low. And I know that I've been playing B-flat tuba all week, so I need to play on F-tuba that evening, for example. That's the type, of, so I, I, it's finding the ways to prioritize in these situations. But the lucky thing about, being in a job is that you have that luxury of prioritizing right when you get to the stage when you when you're still studying as well like you might have something that you have to prepare for in a month's time and you're thinking about it then and stuff whereas quite often i can work on a week-to-week -week basis because i'm not demanded to do something like that at the time but if i have something pressing i prioritize that if i know in a few months i'm playing something really difficult i'll start looking at it then um Sometimes I have a very long period of nothing but stuff that I know really, really well, and I actually don't need to practice it. So all I have to do is just sit there and stay in shape, which can be getting in an hour before the rehearsal and doing a good warm up, and then sitting in the rehearsals. So, like I say, it's how I feel and what I need to do. That's really how it works for me, and it doesn't work for everybody like that. It's um, a lot of people have to practice every day. Um, to make sure that they are ready and ready to go and stuff like that. And that's fine. Um, I don't always have the motivation after sitting there listening to sometimes a conductor that I just don't respect or for whatever reason, it's not because I don't respect them. It's because they annoyed me in a rehearsal or something like that. And that's maybe a bit naive me to say, but I mean, there's, there are times where it happens and I, and I, yeah, I have to be honest because there are times where someone, maybe, maybe the conductor has been really rude to me in a rehearsal, maybe not knowing it, maybe it's just a language barrier or something like that, but they've annoyed me and I'm like, I don't want to play the tuba today. It's just something like that. It can happen. So, <laughs> but it's just trying to find, trying to find the motivation 
to do the right things and making sure that everything you do is for the right reason. Right. So it's, if you go into into a room feeling like crap, it's generally the, what you're going to do isn't going to be your best work. Right. So maybe go for a coffee. Maybe I, I sometimes like there's a pub across the road from where I practice. So maybe I'll go for a beer before I practice sometimes. Just to maybe watch a game of football in the pub, a beer, go and practice afterwards or something like that because – it's just a way for, to you know, chill out and relax after some time. And it's, I mean, it depends when I was, when I auditioned for, I've auditioned for some other orchestras since being here as well. Just one to keep me on my toes and two, because like, they were excellent jobs. And um, so I had to so doing the morning rehearsal and then going straight into the practice room for basically the whole lunch break as well to practice, because that's the time where I could do it. And then go into the next rehearsal and go straight back to the practice room after because I only had the certain amount of time each day to do stuff because maybe I had to do something in the evening or like I say I got my dog I to look after him. So making sure that I have, that I'm um, being, what's the word I'm looking for? Just to make sure that I, I'm prioritizing the right things, making sure that I'm doing them when I need to do it and using the time effectively. That's basically what I'm trying to say. Right. So. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so... On the topic of uh, practicing, a lot of people uh, talk about the uh, difference between mindless practice and uh, deliberate practice. Is there anything that you do uh, whenever you have practice sessions uh, to make sure that you are uh, using the time efficiently and practicing deliberately? Yeah, well, I mean, I like I say, I kind of have this, um, when I'm practicing, I like to use a kind of practice log. So I take notes of everything that I'm doing. I record myself doing them, whether it's video or audio, whatever. But by doing that, I find that I find more of the stuff that I'm doing wrong. And also, if when I'm preparing solo repertoire as well, if, if I can't play something that there's a fast passage, which says written. I was preparing um, the Blotzer Concertino of last year for the Aeolus competition in Germany. And I had to learn it by memory. So and this, I mean, some of the stuff in that is just stupidly quick at the very end of the last minute doing that and i had to start it was uh yeah it was tedious but i you know i sat there got the metronome mark i say i started at 50 and i had to get to 156 or something like that so like i took a third of the tempo really because that was the speed that i could not mess up at basically and i started there and I just put it right, okay, so I run my practice journal. I started at 50 today and then play it. Did I play it right three times in a row? Yes, I did. Okay, tick, 52. And then, so on like that, just adding a few each time. And then by, when I get to the stage where I've either run out of time in my practice, I'm tired or I'm just fed up, then I go, okay, where am I at? I look at the metronome and go, okay, I've gotten to 75 today. And I write that down. And then I start in the middle. So I go back to 63 or something like that. And I start from there and I see how far I can push it the next day. And before you know it, within a couple of days, this extremely hard piece of music that you've just been trying to learn is easy and you can play it. So, I mean, it's just finding ways to get around it, whether you change the rhythms to help yourself. And I mean, I, I like you said, it's, what, what was you said? It's deliberate practice and... Uh, mindless what other? practice. Sorry, what mindless. is it? Uh, mindless practice. Mindless. Okay, right. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, I, I I love mindless practice as well. Actually, it is great. But this deliberate, uh, the deliberate practice is the way to learn stuff. Really. Yeah. Mindless practice is is my basics, if you like, where I put on Netflix and I just play. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I watch so much while I'm practicing, actually. If I'm really concentrating on something, I turn it off. The rest of the time, I've almost always got Netflix on because I, 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 I wouldn't recommend it. It works for me um, because I like the, um, what do you call it? The distraction. Right. Because if I'm, if I'm learning something by memory, I'll try and do it while watching Netflix at the same time because I have to concentrate on two things at once, which is also like when you get into the orchestra and you've got to concentrate on what the orchestra's doing and what the conductor's doing, what the audience reaction is to you if there's a fly that flies in front of your face while you're playing something by memory and puts you off, I've had the distraction already, so I know that I can do it. And then when I have to work on something deliberate, like really specific bits, and I turn it off and I go, okay, right. And I sit there and I go, let's try and play it, try and play it over and over again until it's right. 
and then I turn my Netflix back on again and watch something and play at the same time. It never anything serious, just something like to a family guy put on Rick and Morty and play something like that. It's just funny, you know, it's uh, yeah. yeah, anything to just keep me um occupied as well because yeah, my mind wanders sometimes as well. So it's uh, a good little distraction while I'm like that. So Okay. But. Awesome. Uh so you mentioned uh Alexander uh a bit earlier, Von Poot Counter. Uh yeah. I I've only met him once. Uh Berlin Phil was touring Carnegie, they were doing Mahler Seven. And uh, him and I met for a uh, lesson before the concert. Uh, the first year of my undergrad, I think it was. Uh, yeah. I remember him being like a super down-to-earth, uh, funny guy. Uh, he seems like the uh, type of guy that would be uh, the uh, subject of a uh, few funny stories. Do you have any uh, stories of him you'd like to uh, <laughs> share? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, he's, he's come down here a few times now and we've... Uh... We've had some really good times playing here. We did Alpine Symphony just uh, the end of last year. And uh, he came to Elsa Sprach as well. And um, one, of my, one of my funny, I, I, it's, it's not so much funny this one, but I still remember we did uh, Shostakovich 4 with Berlin Phil in Baden-Baden in Germany. And we were on top of the, the concert hall. Like on the, there's like the cafe had a little terrace in, on the top. And we're sitting there and there's this video and it's, it's it's a German word joke basically, and it's uh, <laughs> it's maybe not funny, but it, it, to me I still find it funny. I'm just sitting there laughing at how this word, this ridiculously long word in German because it keeps adding words and it ends up with barbar 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 he is, he's great. He's just so, he's so much fun to be around and just to hang out with. And he's really, like I say, he's really down to earth. He's just, he's, uh, you're, he's just another guy. You can just chat to him like that. He's not, it's not all true, but it's not all this, it's not all that. It's um, everything. You can speak to him about anything you want to. And that's what's great about him. It's, yeah, it's not, he's not crazy. He's not, um, yeah, he's down to earth and he's a really sound guy. So it's oh. really nice. Awesome. Uh, before we get into our uh, speed around here, one more question. Uh, throughout the uh, remainder of the quarantine, uh, what advice or what do you say to uh, students who would like to uh, use the time uh, that we all have now, but are uh, struggling to find the uh, uh, motivation, if you will, to do so, whether that be uh, from a musician uh, perspective and practicing, or a like a normal human being perspective and uh, hobbies or normal projects. human being. I love that. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, oh, no, no, no. That, that's not what I meant. Like, like a... <laughs> no, I love it. No, you're absolutely right. It's, it's so funny. Yeah, it's, it's really great. <laughs> Musicians and normal human beings. It's pretty much right, honestly. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's trying to stay motivated is obviously the hardest thing just now, and there can be times that will become. Depressed is the wrong word. Um, tough, we'll see. Yeah. Because it's, yeah, it's, it's frustrating not having the constant flow, if you like, of what you of what you're usually used to. Right. And it's frustrating for uh, for me as well. Um, well. I luckily this week had the chance to go and play with my trombone colleagues. We recorded the video, which is actually just coming out very soon on our Facebook page, which is the low brass section of the Orchestra of the Speech Trombon, so check it out. Awesome. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's actually written by our second trombone player, so it's really cool. Oh. But, um, yeah, a little uh, plug there. No, anyway, no, yeah, so, absolutely. <laughs> so, I mean, you just have to always find something new to do. That's kind of one of my first things I would say. Like for example, right just now I'm starting some new recording. I've, I bought loads of recording equipment and I'm getting used to using it and using the interface, the microphones and everything, making sure it's working. With it. I use Reaper to record the stuff, recording myself, putting it into tracks, like multi-tracking it all. Um, yeah, something like that is fun. You can do it on a phone. Reaper is free for 60 days as well. So I think you can even like record it on your phone and get it. In. I'm not sure, maybe not, maybe you need an interface, but um Anyway, so it's just stuff like that. If you can find a way to multi-track stuff, is good. Using uh, a cappella works as well, doing videos like that. It helps your ensemble playing, helps your tuning, making sure that you're playing like that and like one take as well is good. Sight reading is great. I find finding some new studies 
practicing your skills because like I said, skills are the the alphabet of language which people speak. Um, And then finding new ways to do that. So if you find a new study which you enjoy doing, I I work my way through Blazovich, through Bordoni and stuff like that, especially on the B-flat tube, but to work on sound production and et cetera, stuff like that. When I really, if I, if I don't play the B flat tuba for too long, I get I lose my sound, which I want to make. So I need to play stuff like Bordoni and Blazovich and everything to get myself back into the the sound world, which I'm having my head basically, and and being able to play just like sit there and play a low E flat like and just there. Um, so really be strict with yourself to to get yourself push yourself forward to the stage where you need it's like okay I know I can do this and I know I can play this. So that's an important thing as well. Um, learn new pieces, anything solo works that you have wanted to play for a while or find some new ones, uh, whether it's completely alone, whether it's a concerto, speak to friends about it as well, find out what they're playing. If the Sometimes teachers don't want you all to play the same thing at the same time, so be careful with that one. But it's nice to find out what other people are doing because you find new pieces to play. Uh, you might love a piece and you might end up putting it in your final recital or something like that, whatever. Um, take lessons with people if you can, if you if you have unlimited resources for that, it's it's great. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, if so, a lot of people have to make a make a living in this time as well. So um, unfortunately, it does cost money for that as well. But um, it's important to keep your eyes and ears open in these times. So also um, like listening, listening to new pieces, like I said earlier, but with the excerpts and stuff like that, finding lots of different recordings, um, listening to the greatest conductors, the greatest soloists, etc. And if you're a tuba player, uh, don't just listen to tuba players, listen to flute players, cello players, great singers, uh, etc. I mean, you, there, there's, there's so much out there. Spotify, YouTube has everything. You know, it's. Uh, it's a shame that they've kind of killed the musical uh, recording world, but at the same time, it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, such a great resource because it's cheap and it has so much uh, content. Um, like I said earlier, do record yourself for finding ways to improve as well. So it's like you can you can unearth some things that you didn't realize you had bad habits. That's why using a mirror while you're playing or recording yourself with video is good because you can find bad habits and try and fix them, etc. And you have to always self-evaluate while doing this. And that's like, the, the, I, I was always taught in the way that my teacher was teaching me to teach myself, if that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, you, that's what you're always aiming to be because at the end of the day, when you leave college, your teacher isn't there to kick you out the butt anymore or to point out the things that are, you're making mistakes on. So you have to learn to find those things all the time. Right. And this, so it, it doesn't come like that. You have to practice and practice to find them. Yeah. So you have to, and self-evaluation is a good thing. And I also think it's a terrible thing sometimes because you can end up being overcritical and over-evaluating and thinking everything is rubbish, which is why you should also find the good things that you're doing as well. Tell yourself, I made a great sound on that note. I'm going to make sure I do that every time. Or I was really happy with my articulation there. I'm going to try and do that every time as well. And then, but because I did that articulation, this became hard. So that's, that's a good thing to do in this time is to take the time to self-evaluate because you have the time on your own and to learn how to do it. Um, because it's not so easy, especially with doing Zoom lessons and stuff like that. It's not direct contact in lessons, which is obviously a little bit more difficult, but it gives you the chance to try and do that yourself too. Um, making, your, making plans and practice logs and stuff like that is really good. Um, like I was saying before, think about your goals. Think about where you want to go and be. Um, if you if you want to be an orchestral musician, think about what kind of orchestra you want to play in, whether it's opera, symphony orchestra, anything, whether it's pops orchestra, whether it's a concert orchestra, I don't know. It's um, You have to think about that as well. You need to have the time to decide who you want to be, what you want to be as well. And this is a good time to do that to listen around, find some things. The digital concert hall, the Berlin Phil was free for a while. I don't know if it still is now, but that was a good resource. And actually, if you have a spare 150 euros or something like that, I think it's, in fact, it might be a little bit less than that, but if you have that, it's such a fantastic resource. You have live concerts from the Berlin Phil of almost all the repertoire sitting there on their archives with the best conductors in the world. 
and it's all there for the price of a front row seat at one concert, <laughs> right, yeah. which is amazing. So it's, it's such a good thing to use just now. Um, obviously, with the not being able to be in contact with other people all the time, get online and speak to your friends. Uh, speak, speak to people, find out what they're doing, have fun. You know, it's it's nice. Or like do I, I used to do line by line Arban exercises from the Arban book with my friends at college. You can do that just now on Zoom because you don't need to play at the same time. So you can do that type of thing as well. It's, it's fun. Um, and like I said, just relax, recuperate, uh, set yourself some new goals and, and take the time to be yourself right just now. And to, um, it's, 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 a, it's a, obviously a terrible time, but it's also a gift to be able to think about what you want right now, which is, which is a good thing. And yeah, I mean, I'm supposed to be getting married in two days, oh, <laughs> As, awesome. which is like, do I have to reevaluate my whole life now because I can't get married in two days because of this thing? Oh, so it's like, okay. you know, it's like that type of thing. So I have to even like in my life reevaluate what I have to do now and what's going to be next, the next stage for me. When can I do this? Because I need to get it. I'm, not I need to. Sorry, that sounds bad. But I want to get married now. So it's like, when am I going to be able to do this? And it's like so like that's one thing in my life just now which I have to think about. Right. Uh, on top of like when am I going to go back to work and play again so yeah it's just little things like that it's uh, get out and exercise have fun like try and take care of yourself this night that's that's a big thing as well okay that's a lot of stuff I've said there but oh, at the no, same time no worries yeah yeah this, this is all great okay so uh, before we go here uh, let's do a quick speed round I'm going to ask you five questions uh, it may okay. have to do with music it may not have to do with music uh, but telling you right now, most of it is most of it is music. Uh, but here, let's start. Uh, favorite excerpt. Uh, it doesn't have to be tuba. It can be any instrument. Yeah, Bound is a roll. I love it. <laughs> awesome. Uh, hot or cold? Uh, cold. Okay. Awesome. Uh, I'm Scottish. The... I come from the north. Come on. <laughs> oh, <laughs> cold up there. <laughs> True. True. Uh, what was the last thing you listened to? God, I can't remember. Uh, best Music der Stadtwien, I think. What was that? Best Music der Stadtwien by oh, Strauss. Oh, okay. Yeah. Listen to that today. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, if you could play any any of the uh, two tuba repertoire with uh, any tubas, past or present, who would it be? Uh, oh, God. Oh, that's a hard question. Um, oh, there's so many. I need to answer this quickly, don't I? I would have loved to have played with John Fletcher. That would have been cool. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. And then uh, our last one. Uh, your last name is Knight. You're about to go into battle. Choose your weapon. B flat F tuba, B flat E flat tuba, uh, C and F tuba, C and E flat tuba. Oh, I'll tell you what, I'd take them all. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's a good answer. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All be prepared. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, I'll check to see if uh, any anyone maybe has a question or, or uh, two. Uh, if if not, then I I guess this will be it. Uh, let me double check here. Uh, I don't see that anyone has. Uh, but yeah, I I guess that does it. Ross, thank you very much. Very cool. Uh, yeah, for uh, coming on. Thank you for everything. Uh, thank no you for problem. being the first no guest. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <Honor>. yeah. <laughs> yeah, keep staying well. Uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll keep in touch. And really? yeah, Of course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Keep playing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll do. We'll do. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll see you around. We'll, we'll uh, definitely talk soon. Really? Yeah, take care. And uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me. Yeah, All absolutely. Right. <laughs> All right, see you later. <laughs> see you soon. Bye.